Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it to you. We're about to dive in and just talk, you know, really any of the questions that you have on tokenomics, on designing your economy. I mean, you're taking on an awesome project that is um, closer to, I think, institutions and that a traditional way of trying to look at things, I guess maybe I'd call it. Maybe not even traditional because it's pre post-traditional. Um, that's different from a lot of the other projects. I think it'll it'll take a more nuanced approach and careful, slow kind of approach is how I'm maybe feeling this out. So anyway, I'd love to hear what you think, your reflections, and just kind of dive right into the heart of it. Yeah. I've often felt like I struggled to um, feel like I'm not an imposter in, amongst the 12. Like I'm, I've really enjoyed learning stuff and I can definitely see the reason why I'm there. That's why I applied. And so I'm glad that you you keep reinforcing that, that you can see something in it. But um, I lack a lot of the control that some of the others have, either through their landowner partners or through directly owning it themselves privately. And and so the, the trajectory they can take is is maybe clearer to them at this stage than it is to me who I'm trying to influence um, some people that are hard to influence and have established ways of doing it and see this stuff as a, as a threat. So um, maybe in some of the learnings for future course participants, uh, it's quite a good case study having me here because I, um, the progress that I make will be potentially slow and limited, or it may suddenly ramp straight up because it's already in progress and it's been years in the making and it's got millions of pounds already spent on it, developing the master plan and going through the planning proposal so that all this stuff is in train it's just a big scheme and it'll take 10 years to come through and the bit that we're talking about is is a phased delivery of a trust of which it'll be the assets will come in about three or four different tranches across that 10-year period um a secondary challenge is that no community-owned trust is going to be trusted by the developers and the land landowner pool um because it's about seven or eight landowners. Some of them are Oxford colleges. Some of them are local authority, like municipalities. And some of them are just farmers. And they're all tied together by a land pool trust, which is a, a legal uh, definition, which have an, as an equivalence agreement, meaning that regardless where on the site you own your piece of land, whether it's right by the road or right at the back or some grubby bit or some really you know, high ecological value, they all got the same per meter squared. So it's dealing with some of these structures. And I want to go through the economic principles because I've gone through, I've watched all of the videos and um, participated in some of these classes and participated in some of the chat conversations in through Discord. Mm, I feel quite confident about some of the incorporation legal structure stuff, the community uh, organizational stuff, connecting to bodies in the UK and different traditional finance routes. But I'm sat here looking at my spreadsheet of all the costs, uh, looking at the gross development value. I, I'm fairly familiar with dealing with these kind of spreadsheets, mostly for smaller schemes, so like three to 10 million pound schemes. Um, but the principles are essentially the same, just with different numbers. Um, and I've got a few of them sort of set out and some of them will be, I've got a mirror board to share. So I can talk through some of my current ideas of structures. Um, I think the one question that I'd like to walk away from here is having looked to design a, a economic system for this, a tokenomic system, token economic, um, is the fixed supply versus variable supply conversation in the con worked quite actively now with um, traditional dream factory. And so I'm very familiar with their model um, of a single governance financial token registered with the Swiss authority, very similar to the community benefit society in the UK with the FCA, almost it's a bit spooky, actually, like things like individual investors can invest up to a hundred thousand Swiss francs or pounds per, you know, so like round numbers and a lot of the claw. Uh, the difference being that Switzerland has tokenomics, uh, sorry, um, uh, token uh, investor legislation now as of a couple of years and it's been developing for a while UK has none of that um, but I've had conversation with uh, Co-ops UK which is a trade body in the UK 
they don't see any issues with running a, a DAO through a community benefit site in the UK. So I've, there's bits of that that I've got. Um, and there's traditional dream factory, which I understand and have been trying to help them with contribution um, accounting and massive notion thing with roles and uh, we're tracking meetings and like, we've got this entire system going that's not at all applied across salt cross at the moment um so if i share what we've got at the moment so i've been collecting information in this here which will someday be a more coordinated view something to share at the end of all of this and i've been trying to draft out where i think bits of uh bits of this could work so essentially just to talk through the structures again as maybe you already know um salt cross garden village trust is likely to be a community benefit society uh it's a registered society for the benefit uh, usually people that work and live on a scheme so that's this and it'll be designed in the model of Letchworth gardens city and all the different garden cities that sit across the uk already and have been operating for our over 100 years. Um, there's something to look at here in the traditional sense that's easily to apply. And underneath that, there'll be a number of project-based companies because although this trust will own homes, there'll be a number of co-housing schemes, there'll be affordable housing on the site. Each of those will be owned by its own entity. So I can see those being owned by this top company, which owns the site freehold and issues leases. So I'm just trying to get this sort of three-layer thing going of, these all have leases. They are they're owned by the project company, but essentially the project company owns the entire freehold of the of the site and issues leases to everyone else. And then I've got in my head, in terms of the fact that we've got no token legislation in the UK, a a twinning um, of companies of a digital company, which is the effective DAO and is advisory to the to the art the article sat within this. So cost garden village trust this is how um traditional dream factory is working as well like their dow and the delegates that come up to oasa will be advisory only and that's the way the swiss legislation will work as well the directors could uh, but the dow makes decisions and then it's taken as an advisory capacity so this will work the same way and each of these projects which it could be like a 50 home co-housing scheme will have their own DAO set in here and, and participate up into the top level DAO. Um, we'd also have a management company and they would operate in, in um, some. Yeah. Every now and again, uh, there's just a small lag. So I'm going to ask you to just go back and repeat if I actually missed a critical part. So that might happen every now and again. Um, so could you just go back two seconds to what you're talking about projects and having a DAO? I just missed something there. Yeah, sure. Um, so each of these, and I can probably illustrate it better this way, actually. If this is the wider DAO that sits across all of it, this entity here, within the Garden Village Trust, and I've, I've allocated this circle as the real world, this is the projects on the ground, the houses and the assets that sit under it. There may be a self-build co-op that sits on the site with 12 homes. And that self-built co-op itself would have a project DAO associated to it and a person that sits as a delegate within the wider uh, entity, so which would be made up of local professionals, stakeholders, so people that uh, run shops or neighboring or the concept of a community land trust as it currently sits. And then, for example, this person that sits in the self-built co-op is represented down here as one of the project delegates. So there's some of the structures that I'm thinking and all of that can be changed. But what I was explaining at the right at the end of that was that there'll be a manner for running this Salt Cross Garden Village Trust. And that's one of the important aspects is that we can prove that it has a professional estate management team. And um, that that's important for showing legitimacy to the existing stakeholders. They want to see that the people running this trust who are the employees of the DAO um, will have the skills to do it, have the resources to do it. They're a professional team. And so I've called it a project, uh, also a project DAO at this stage, but essentially there'll be a, a company of people who have a communication platform between them and some resources to pull on. 
Um, so I don't really have that bit yet, but in the traditional world, there would be a management and maintenance company. So that's the overall thing. I previously had these things over here, so they will make more sense as a flow in this direction. Um, said before. Um, and then what I've explained to you, so the bit that I, I don't really know how to, so is that okay? Is that clear as in terms of the relationships? Yeah, sure. I mean, yes. Currently I'm getting, um, you're mirroring a traditional structure, essentially plugging in some, you know, digital twins, so to speak, on top of what is, you know, commonly accepted in the UK, or at least close to, right? Um, and then giving coordination structures that probably don't exist in the traditional sense. So I think that's the real big innovation I see so far is giving containers for people to coordinate within, you know, um, the garden village that may or may not exist in, you know, current garden villages. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm following so far. And the attitude is that all of this is fully possible with the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. So that feels good. And the Law Commission at the moment is currently just finished off their, their review. So I think in the, in the shortish term, some of the things that we need to do this effectively will be in place. Like they're already through all of the consultation theories they've already reported to government, um, as well as law tech advising on uh, digital companies of which that's the way in which I can talk about it at this stage. Essentially, we're talking about a company with a higher degree of automation. And the bit that will scare the Financial Conduct Authority is when you raise money into one of these bodies at the moment, you do it as a share offer, a community share offer. So you're issuing equity in your, in your organization. Usually when you do that, you do it in a three-month period or like six-month period, very defined. You do one public share release. And um, and you move away, and you've issued the shares in your company, um, in your organisation. That's a very special niche that these registered societies get, aside from companies and listed companies. That is a it's a special exemption. It's 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 you've got to be really careful that there's no individual benefit there. And so the thing that they'll they'll be really hot on is this: if the shares can be bought and sold every second and so the the equity placements in your company can can shift very actively um how are you getting snapshots of that at any point in time because at the moment it's very slow like they may come in and audit you over um once a, once every five or six years and at that point to be honest the land trusts that i've worked with have very bad records and this can only be improved by having very accurate records of who the current shareholder is and all these things. So that's the bit that they may be a bit sensitive to is having this perpetual um, share offering going on that they're just not familiar with at this stage. Well, and is that also where, you know, variable or total supply of tokens comes into the picture? So if you're constantly issuing new equity, is that a... Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Because yeah. when I started talking about people being paid in equity, essentially, like gain, gaining contribution recognition in equity, then he was like, oh, I'm not so sure about that, because that wouldn't happen in existing trusts, that suddenly someone would get their member register share allocation changed. They would get money as an employee or they'd be volunteering. So this is where, you know, if I'm plugging something in here, I'm very sensitive to this because we could spend a lot of time with the revolution and fail at making a renaissance so we can build all of this fancy digital technology and make absolutely no real impact on what changes. You know, basically we just repeat building corporations on the blockchain um, that tend to concentrate wealth. So that's where it might need to be a phased approach. Uh, like this is just me going right to the bottom of it. Um, where I'd love... How do I want to respond to this? Maybe I'll just let you keep going because, <laughs> yeah. I, I, just as an aside on this bit, I've really enjoyed the, the conversations around the 508C1, uh, is it? Uh, like all of those conversations, like I can really see the benefits of those. Uh, I've enjoyed seeing those being wrapped in the CLT world. And I'm trying to figure out like how can I incrementally just nudge this in a direction that is achievable while still trying to get something that 
honors where I think community land trusts already sit, like these questions of sovereignty and uh, getting to a position where states can't affect the affordable housing that people have spent, in often cases, decades of their lives trying to create these assets into citizen-led bodies that can instantly be captured. Like that stuff sits really well with the community land trust sector, I would say. In this specific case, um, I'm trying to figure out like, what is it that we can change that could meaningly, meaningfully affect a community land trust setting up next year or five years or 10 years and know that we will update these as we start making progress. So my focus at the moment is how can I create something initially that um, the FCA will approve that we can run token offerings against and share offers? What sort of sits as familiar is my current approach. Yeah. Um, so I guess a familiar map to this would be the, you know, A16s, that VC company, they wrote a paper on progressive decentralization, which is essentially, you know, you start off your DAO as a company and using all those basic rules and procedures. And then over time, you know, you decentralize and give it over to the community. Um, I see a similar thing potentially here, you know, that 10 year model that you're talking about where you start off with, hey, this is the legal framework that you're most comfortable and familiar with. You know, if we stopped there, then we made zero impact. And this was, in my opinion, kind of worthless. You know, we used all this really difficult technology for no point. Um, so then that would be the interesting part is then how do you keep going? So we might be able to have things. And it, I, I also understand that this needs to be tested. You build that digital twin to test in like a low stakes environment. And then you can, you know, transition things over as they prove themselves or they don't prove themselves. They need to remodel it. For example, instead of saying we're going to reissue equity to everyone with a token, you can issue a token that's just a contribution accounting token and maybe doesn't reflect equity at this point. Um, and then that can go out all the time. So you're still acting that. But then maybe once a year and once every two years, the board gets together and says, you know what, we're going to reissue shares based on these contribution accountings. And then they can make an official proposal and do their process and then just issue new shares, you know, once a year, however often, right? Um, if they feel like that contribution accounting was fair, you know, wasn't, you know, hacked or whatever, abused or whatever the case is, right? Um, so I think that could be a really beautiful way of like maintaining the intention while still staying within the legal framework that, you know, regulators are comfortable with. Um, yeah, I think that might be quite manageable as a first step i actually this um being able to issue shares actively all the time i think is something that i would like to test through this so there's a number of things here that i want to test that are unfamiliar like i don't want to just go with the grain like we're challenging the fca so now that i've found out that the fca would be totally fine with all the other stuff that we've talked about which i wasn't expecting I thought they'd okay. really have. Now you can find with... where you can challenge. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's like figuring out. I'm, I'm definitely trying to find out what are the edges to this that we can push at, um, and I think this is one that we can overcome, precisely because of that thing we said before. Of it's more accurate. Like we can maintain the member member register so much more actively, and they can check it at any time. Like they they don't. My experience is really that. Uh, every, all land trusts quickly scrabble to get their member register looking accurate so that someone can look at it. And this just wouldn't be the case with this. And oh, yeah. I don't see an issue. As long as we can prove that uh, the benefits wrap back into the community and that no one individual or sets of individuals are profiting from this system individually, which is as an investment, and that's a, there's a gray area there because they can gain a return on their investment of a small amount and there's a sort of acceptable range. But as long as no one's making a huge winning and has a conflict of interest, I think this is going to be fine. Well, uh, fortunately, that lines up with, I think, our goals as well with designing these economies is. Yeah, so it seems like we're in alignment of their intended or stated purpose of what they're trying to accomplish. Meaning we aren't so. trying to build an economic system to concentrate wealth into a small handful of people. In fact, we're trying to do the exact opposite. So if they have that same intention and drive behind their regulations, and yeah, I think that's a, I would see that this could be a place we can continue helping innovate and helping them achieve their goals a little bit more effectively. I.e. you have a real time registry of who owns tokens all the time rather than, you know, having to ask for that and it takes years. I love that. Um, the second huge innovation, I want, you, I want to get your opinion on this, is around roles. So if roles can give you rights, authority, and mean something, 
So for example, something that's really inspired me for a decade now is, um, and one, one thing I think is a huge potential of this technology is the example with healers for an artist. So healers, you know, they hate charging for their gift. Every community needs a healer or a healer type, whether it's a doctor, or a naturopath, whatever it is, right? Um, but they hate charging for these things. And a lot, or at least a lot of them that I talk to, it seems to be the bane of their existence, um, or they feel dirty about it, or just doesn't make sense. And then it often ends up that they can only, you know, heal the people that are wealthy enough to afford the healing or whatever. So using that one, you know, roll case, what does it look like for the Salt Cross Garden to have rolls for the village or each project? Maybe it's probably more manageable. Each neighborhood of, you know, 30 homes or whatever it is um, has these rolls in their DAO that if someone's feeling it, they get, you know, maybe some of their needs met. Maybe if they're filling this role, they get housing and food covered. Maybe it's housing, food and a salary or whatever it is. And then they can just freely offer that gift to the community. So if it's a healer, they're just there to, you know, heal whoever needs healing. And this realigns the incentives. So now instead of them wanting people to be sick so they can make money and charging people, now they would prefer to do nothing at all if we're just looking at pure incentive base, right? Um, they'd prefer for everyone to be healed and have to, you know, do very little work on a day to day. So it can start mm -hmm. fixing some of the weird, you know, quirks that capitalism created. Um, same thing with food producers. You know, food producers today, they want to sell food. They want people to be hungry. Again, pure incentive model here is, you know, they prefer for people to be hungry. So you have to keep buying food from us and you stay in business. But instead, you could say, no, you have the permaculture role and your job is to make sure this project is dripping with food and that's free, you know, <laughs> so they're just running around planting forests. Um, so that's what I think would also be just. OK, yeah, so I wanted your reflection on that. Is that something you think the authority or regulators should be like eh, gray area or is that just so far out of their purview that they're just not interested in it? And this would be something you can experiment with, with, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, they don't care. So it's not a registration issue. This yep. is a society issue, and that's one of the benefits of a society versus a company. So it's totally up to the society to decide a lot of these things. Awesome. And um, so it's it's not oh, yeah, it's not in the articles. Um, it's not necessary. So I, that's absolutely fine. I would say um, the practicality of doing it is something that I'd like to learn more about um, of of accounting for these elements. And I've seen obviously I've seen uh, the walkthroughs of the um, high for do system and uh, some of the other kind of mirror board stuff that you've showed so far, but trying to do this with TDF um, across the last cycle to so getting really more involved across the last few months and then just getting involved in the final accounting process of who gets what. It was a real, it's been a real challenge, um, especially doing it through Notion. And so gaining some kind of platform to be able to account for this stuff and then be able to account for it within the company accounts, which is what the person that I gained advice from, from Cops UK was saying is like, you just need to be able to understand what's equity, what's debt. If someone stops being a member, any equity transforms into debt. And so that's an issue to be dealt with. Um, there's a, is that, is there's that a, a legal requirement to transform equity into debt and not letting <sighs> hold on to it, sell it or, yeah. Yeah, so it goes onto the company's balance sheet as debt at the point at which they're not a member anymore. And they've managed to recently set up companies where you can come to an agreement that that debt may be settled within three years. Because one of the issues here is whether or not you've got enough liquidity to be able to hand out straight away to someone's um, share allocation if they want to pull it all out in one go. Um, that's something that I haven't thought too much about yet. Um, but... I can't, I can't see an issue there in terms of uh, some of the vesting models that I've seen. Like, say, if you had a contract that was saying, as soon as the point at which you uh, stop being a member, you go into a vesting contract that's maybe three years to model the, what's familiar, and you can withdraw your debt slowly from the, from the organization in a measured and planned way. So that sort of stuff feels like it has a familiar basis between the two worlds as well. Yeah, and that's that's simple. I think that could be solved rather simply. I mean, that's just who sends tokens where. So you could say a member leaves, then they send all their equity tokens, and now they get debt tokens, and you know, in place of that. And then the organization as a whole could then sell those tokens on the open market to pay them off if if there's enough liquidity in the market, right? Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's it's sort of like it's, an, it's a it's not really answering your question at this point in terms of a take because the the thing I want to draw into there is 
where you're valuing different forms of capital that aren't financial, uh, but you're valuing them in company shares, how does the FCA view that on your balance sheet as a company for equity versus debt? And so understanding that bit is an outstanding question that I've got. And so with the role bit, part of it is also not having tokens at all. So moving things out slowly. So I didn't get into this one too much, but let me just share something with you as a, another frame of thinking through this it might be helpful. Um, let me share this. I just guess it just wants to share my screen. Um, let me know when this is all up and you can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Which one's the least messy here? All right, maybe. I'll go this one. Um, yeah, so I'll do this for now. So this is what a lot of what we've been talking about so far is these two spheres. Um, the one on the left being fully token mediated, meaning, you know, you did a you did something, you've received some tokens, which the old world, as I'm going to call it, is it's easy to account for that. You saw $100,000 worth of tokens flow back and forth. We know how much to tax you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really easy one to one conversion, right? Um, you know, tokens look like stocks or dollars, et cetera. So the role is another sphere that gets a little bit blurred there because we can start removing the dollar value. So for example, if a healer is going around healing people, you're not actually tracking, you know, the economic value of every healing. You know, they're not charging a hundred dollars for a session or whatever it is anymore. Like they're just doing it. Right. So you start moving, it starts abstracting away, you know, what's the actual dollar value of your GDP, for example. Right. Um, but where I think some pro well, a lot of the projects we're dealing with, but this could be really interesting to start weaving into salt cross is then how do you go even further than that? You go through another sphere that removes, you know, any economic tracking altogether. So in that role, like maybe you're still getting a salary, you know, you're still you're earning equity and tokens or whatever for having that. But then maybe a, a neighborhood of seven families, just giving another example, they just come together and say, hey, you know, on Tuesday, I'll take the kids. On Wednesday, they'll take the kids. And on Thursday, we'll make a family dinner and then share it with the whole neighborhood or whatever. You start encouraging these things through the DAO too. And you start moving entirely away from money. Now it's a trading system. You know, I do X, you do Y, like kind of barter um, without tokens mediating any of it. Again, if it's like a seven families coming together to co-educate their kids, it's just I take them one day of the week and here's a process to facilitate that, right? Um, so that's something I would I would love to kind of see plugged into some of the neighborhoods of how can we move out of those economic relationships and start building more trust and community with those groups, right? Um, but each one of these spheres, you know, they tend to have smaller amounts of people, you know, that could be part of this. So the whole Salt Cross project, you know, um, is probably these roles, the third sphere here. Um, so across, you know, neighborhoods or whatever you want to call them within the project, you still have tokens and you can move from one role to another, from one project to another, right? And right here, Salt Cross interacts with the whole world this way. You know, potentially, maybe this isn't for the, you know, the trust necessarily, but people could buy tokens from Salt Cross, regardless of where they're at in the world and, you know, speculate on the success of the Garden Cross Village or whatever it is, right? Um, if that's even remotely within the FCC's purview. Uh, and then the final one I'd like to just plug in here is then what does it look like the family unit? So again, traditionally, this was like, you know, parents and their children. But again, how can we extend this out? Maybe this is a case where we're having this is the neighborhood and we're trying to uh, figure out more beautiful ways of coordinating and meeting our needs that are, again, mediated by, you know, this accountability measurement systems that we're putting in place. Um, so this is how I'm, I'm currently kind of <laughs> trying to build spheres here of saying, you know, how are we coordinating within this sphere? And how can we make sure we're moving? Because I think if we stayed here, well, here it's depressing. This is where a lot of people are lacking purpose and we're starting to see all the mental health breakdowns because there's no community, there's no meaning, there's no connection, right? Um, so it's kind of very impersonal. But that's fine because it helps us scale. Why, you know, here, the love level, if this is really happening within your families, there's a lot of connection, but then it doesn't scale well. You're having a hard time coordinating. So it's, it's thinking about all of these spheres and how they plug into, you know, our village and our projects. 
Um, I just wanted to plant that as a concept because I think DAOs and the tools we're building can start coordinating each one of these spheres with probably the intention that we're moving more towards the right side or more intrinsically guided by what's driving our interactions, our relationships, how we're meeting our needs, rather than everything again being mediated by dollars and things that look and act like dollars, pounds, you know. Um, so I'll pause there. Yeah, I can see, thanks for that useful interjection. Um, I can see how in existing co-housing groups that we're working with, they operate more on the right side as well, Exit like already built mm -hmm. um, because of these because of the trust circles that they inhabit um, through managing their the place they live together. And when that hits the edges of their uh, scheme, they they struggle to not be an alien item that's plonked down with very hard edges. They may, may own, they may invite people in every now and then, but they're not very permeable um, into their existing community. And often we've tried to encourage these groups to uh, to also have community land trusts to reach out into those existing communities because the difference is that uh, these more cooperative structures are looking inward whereas the community land trusts look outwards to a wider community those two things is that intersect between that ikigai role and the, the trust um, and knowing section i would say that the community land trusts continue to do a good job of i don't know how to like so I, it's good for me to just sit on it and think about it for a while because sure. i see this as what happens over uh, 50 years and understanding how this happens over the first 10 uh, is something to think about and measure because sure like what we hear from the garden cities in all the reports is that there's a much higher level of integration and um, uh, cohesion coordination between people um, because of the way in which they've set that wealth structure up at the local level and the, the levels of control they have over their community over a very long period. Um, so let me think about it, because uh, one thing that sprung off as you were talking about it is often these schemes, when they first start these, these brand new schemes, because they're delivered by a cost model that's always pushing downwards towards the reduction of costs, the increase of, of sale values, sale prices, um, you really get the infrastructure being delivered, the, the crucial infrastructure being delivered last. So you get roads and stuff if they're made to. Um, I don't know if you're breaking up a bit or maybe I am. I'm getting you perfect. Yeah, you're getting it. Okay. Uh, you get you get some roads and you get some high valued houses, maybe at certain parts of it, but then you don't get the community centers. You don't get the doctor's facilities. You often don't get the affordable housing on, unless there's a, a financial crash, in which case everyone wants the, house, the affordable housing still because the government can, can incentivize that um and does like in 2007 8 the uh, sorry 2009 there was a kickstart program that put money into developers hands to build the affordable housing because it's something that the state could could push and so you you get these barren wastelands of developments where over their development period there's just nothing for new people moving into these places to do there's not shops and schools and like i said facilities so i think by thinking about it this way you could bring in a lot more of these sort of maybe traditionally softer or community-driven trust um, elements quicker. And that could be something to track across this period. What I don't understand or what I, maybe I could do with some help in is how would you plan for this stuff in, in the scheme like ours or any of the ones in the 12 as it starts to get out of um, being a, a diagram uh, on a, a slide deck to like, what do I do with this information in a planning sense? Um, and I can also see how you can story tell. I can story tell this, but it's what do I do when we're trying to um, make this case to developers, to local authorities, to wider communities? Um, how do I use it? I guess is what I'm saying. Um, there's so many ways and so many places to go with this. So let me just shotgun it so i gave you this map why i brought it up well one of the reasons why was one to just think about it um two was and this is where i feel like it actually comes into the design process is i'm calling them rites of passage you know a right you do in order to pass through one membrane to the next um and this would be something to be considered it's hard when you're getting me to 
things you don't own. But anyway, I'll let you see if this fits into your context because sometimes laws prevent us from doing this. Um, but it's actually structuring these things up front to say you're part of this sphere once you've done X, Y, Z, whatever that is. So for example, you enter into the first sphere once you buy a token. That's easy. Anyone can get onto a decentralized exchange and buy a token, right? Then you get into this sphere once you have a role. So you've been voted into a role and those are every season, for example, like people come together and they're saying, yep, these are all the roles we want for next season, which is how you keep you know, the accountability. So this is at the beginning when people are coming together, they don't really know each other. They don't have that trust yet. How Haifa has been running and how we can suggest groups run is every season, You know, the planners come together and they say, this is what we want to accomplish next season. These are the roles we're going to need. You know, who wants to be part of next season, et cetera. So community members should come together and be like, yeah, next season we want to plant a bunch of gardens. So let's have a bunch of roles for gardeners or whatever it is, right? And then if you get into a role, then great, you're into that role and you're earning your tokens or whatever it is. You've done that right. That right is get into a role, right? So then each neighborhood might start setting up their own right for how you join that neighborhood. And once you're in that neighborhood, it might come with certain benefits as well. So this is on the planning side, because as you're designing these neighborhoods, you're saying, what does it mean to be part of this neighborhood? How, how can you be part of this neighborhood? When you're using a society or something like a 508 that we talked about, like those religious structures, you can absolutely do this. It's the same thing as like being a monk and being part of the monastery. There are very strict procedures about how you're able to be able to do that. And if you're, if you're a monk, you know, you're able to get housing and food and whatever that is, right? Um, so it's a similar structure to that. We're not creating anything completely new. This is kind of like the monastery model in a way. Um, so each one of these would have a very intentional kind of process for how you enter and exit, for that matter, each one of these boundaries. Um, so I mentioned this at the forefront because then it's something to consider as you're designing these neighborhoods. What does it mean to be part of this neighborhood? Like, is there a particular right to get into that? For example, here at this project, the people who really want to do the, the village project here, they're saying, hey, you know, we've done intentional community a bunch. We've tried it a whole bunch. And we know that people need to be at a certain level of, you know, emotional and spiritual maturity in order for this to really work. So before we allow people into our, you know, 30 hectare, which is what we're playing with right now, um, garden village, because we're going to be growing a whole bunch of food there. We want people to go through a one month, you know, process. And this process is going to have certain things that will demonstrate that you've, of, you know, emotional and physical and then spiritual maturity. Um, so that's where, you know, for example, let me just give you a simple one. Um, if you're a tank neighborhood and you're really interested in only having people who are building DAOs and smart contracts and tech stuff, I'm not saying this is a real example. It's just a thought process. So part of the right would be that you've got to go and issue a smart contract. Okay, well, only people who really know what they're doing are going to be able to pull that off. So the the right itself is the filter for who's going to be part of that particular project. Um, so this is at the edge of what I've been thinking here is you have the vision, which is in the attractor. That's great. Every project needs an attractor, but you really also need the filter for the membrane of who and what is going to partic you know, participate within that sphere. Um, so having these things at the onset is how you decide who's going to be a member, who's going to be joining this project, what might they have to go through to be part of this neighborhood versus that neighborhood, you know, et cetera. Um, so I'm only bringing this at the forefront because it is kind of one of those initial, all right, we're designing these neighborhoods. What does it mean to be part of these different neighborhoods? You know, for example, you know, affordable housing, you're only looking for people who might need that. It would be silly if, you know, a multimillionaire came in and took a house at affordable housing. So, you know, one of the requirements for being part of that neighborhood might be that you actually need affordable housing, you know. Uh, as a simple mm. case study, but I think this is where it gets deeper and where it's going to inform the development process. So if those neighborhoods are informing what gets developed there, they're all going to have a different flavor, likely, for the communities they're trying to serve and the communities they're trying to attract. You know, if we keep going about development in a general sense, trying to attract this, you know, general person, we end up really attracting no one and it not really being a great place for anyone to be part of, which is how we get the suburbia we have today, you know, because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're trying to be general. And a lot of that is because of laws, you know, you can't be exclusive with who you're trying to sell housing to sometimes. Um, so this is where I'm putting it in is like, what if we are exclusive, but diverse um, for the neighborhoods and then they can take on a culture and a flavor that is really, you know, meaningful and impactful for the people who are part of that. Um, Lots of thoughts there. I don't know. If yeah, I know. I mean, it's uh, I love it. In, there's a, um, yeah, I, I really enjoy listening to these descriptions. I the the 
gap I've got at the moment is is just the the scale transfer, and maybe I could do is seeing some more examples. Um, I can see this in the work that I've done with groups before and these layers. I can see it in my own company and the uh, roles that people take on over many years and the, the moments of celebration and, and ritual that we bring out, the importance of those as people move through differing layers and the trust that increases. I can see that as applied to other things uh, that I touch. I think I've sat here looking at Salt's Cross, which is, it'll be 5,000 people across what is currently planned as three neighborhoods, um, but will be made up of lots of little streets and things, has been planned in a very way. Like it's it's scribbles on a map and like the people that are moving there are gem, general average people um, in the way that they've designed for this place. I'm saying general and average in the, from their perspective, like they don't know who's coming right. to this place. Whoever will buy is going to enable this this and so they're going to do a really expensive sales job to attract those people in and and it's new it's you know green fields at the moment that can empty of anything apart from monoculture uh, aside from a few parts of the site so everything that confers any kind of culture will either have to be created or come from the existing village on the other side of this mass this big motorway and so I understand what I, I think I understand what you're I'm trying to figure out how at this stage that I'm sat at here, which is very top level, do I plan for this in a way that's uh, useful in me telling this story to a number of different people, to the community members in the existing village, to people that may want to come and live here, to the co-housing groups we're already working with who want to buy plots of land in this site? Um, and the landowners and small institutional partners. Um, and maybe I'm just sort of pitching this at the wrong level. So like I've got this aspiration of this giant trust and really affecting the big picture stuff and making a, a dent, thinking that maybe I won't achieve that. Um, and the lowest level of that is one of these plots gets designed in this way. So maybe 110 homes will, or even smaller grouping of homes will have the opportunity to be designed in the way that you're talking about, where we can uh, control these processes a lot more effectively, not from my individual perspective, but the group of people that will go on to live in these places and design them together in a dynamic and ongoing fashion. So some of what I think as I've listened to this, listened to the course across this period is, um, am I casting my net too high in this belief that of trying to affect the assets and liabilities of a much wider on a much wider scale, such that we can properly resource governance, because that's been a big part of my focus. Is governance in the UK is mostly a free and voluntary act done by people that don't really want to be sat there, and in some cases want to hold on to power, uh, and that younger people, people that don't have the confidence or the time or the money to afford them the time just don't participate in governance at a local level how do you properly resource that at a much wider neighborhood level and if you can build that in from the beginning you've got to start and i can do either do that across five thousand people or we can do that across 50 people well and um <laughs> i guess what i'm trying to explain here is like i've just got this constant niggle of like should i just focus on one co-housing group as a little piece of this scheme and if we get further then that's great uh, i i'm gonna just throw something at you catch what lands um one more slide for you <laughs> love these things they just maps um let me see bring it up okay because this is again very end of my thinking i literally put this slide in today to talk about this project here and now i'm seeing some parallels that might be helpful so you've got five thousand people um that is too big to coordinate with i'm thinking a number is more around 150 so what does that look like if you broke up salt cross into neighborhoods of 150 um, and that's 150 participants, so it might be 150 households, which will change the scale. But either way, I'm, I'm asking maybe look at more than three neighborhoods. Um, benefits here. Uh, it's the same thing with like multi-level marketing. You, get, you take your ad budget and you pay that to people instead for them going out there and getting their friends and stuff. 
might be a similar concept here. You say, hey, we have these 12 neighborhoods, for example, each with a different theme. This is going to be an affordable housing neighborhood. This is going to be, you know, the deep co-housing urban neighborhood. This is going to be more suburban or whatever it is. You set the theme as the developer and what's aligned with what they're trying to accomplish. Okay. And then you have the open call where they come in and they get to design, it, especially if it's monocrops. Like that's a cool place because it's a little bit more blank, if that makes sense. So the canvas of what can be created could be a little bit more digital unless you needed to really show up because if it's potch marked with, you know, ponds and lakes and trees and things you might not want to cut down and stuff, it takes a little bit more like on the ground envisioning what's going to happen. Um, although that piece is still relevant. Point is, is you can have these 12 neighborhoods, call people together now, not, you know, years from now to start dreaming up what their village wants to look like. And then they're the ones that are inviting other people to their communities, you know, that this is fully successful on theory. You don't do any advertising, you know, marketing takes care of itself because one person's like, wow, yeah, I love this village concept. And I have a whole bunch of friends who'd be great for this. Let me get them to sign up. And they're kind of like driving the show because they want to, you know, have a big say in who their neighbors are. So you let those like intrinsic motivators kind of grow the project. So from a you know very utilitarian perspective, you could say you could save money on you know costs of advertising, et cetera. Again, I don't know what the laws are because some laws say you have to be completely open, but in this case, you still could be completely open. But if you're not doing active marketing, well, who knows about it? People are only going to know about it from word of mouth. So you you know, and you invite a couple of stewards who might be, you know, really great representatives from those 12 projects, and then they start inviting people to be like, yep, you know, we'll sell our place in London and we'll move out here because we love this vision, right? Um, so this is what we did with our project here. We have these three different neighborhood concepts. One's like a village growers camp. This is very rural, like every house has, you know, a hectare to grow food. And this is where we're producing all of our food for the whole project. So people who really want to live on homesteads, have their family, live next to homesteads, you know, very green, earth-centered people, they're going to love this. This is what they want. Uh, okay, but we also have a refi urban center. So this is solar punk city, you know, dense living. This is digital notepads wanting apartments and then building out their startups. And this is fantastic too. Good. So we're going to reimagine, you know, urban thriving in a solar punk micro city. Um, and there's a place for that. And then we have the incubator that we've been talking about a lot. So that's a different setting. So who are the people? This is kind of how we put it. The people are like facilitator, educators, coordinators in the incubator camp. The people are like young family centered homesteaders in the grower camp. Um, the refi creators camp are, you know, coordination technologists, you know, digital nomads, et cetera. Um, so you kind of have your neighborhood set up that way where you're having a general target audience. So instead of the whole thing being like, yeah, general average person, that, which means nobody, everyone in marketing knows that means no one um, when you try to apply for everyone. So this is what's saying, nope, we have 12. We have a general theme for the whole 5,000 person. Whatever that is, it's up to you, of course. And then you make your micro themes and then you invite people into that DAO now and then they can start dreaming up what they want their best community to be, which if we're plugging into previous things we've talked about, that process might be, you know, what are our needs as a community? What are we trying to accomplish? So, for example, if you have the, you know, retired community that's just urban housing and you got a bunch of old people, their needs for what they're looking for are going to be very different from the young family needs and what they're trying to look for in a neighborhood. So when you pull together similar people under a similar vision, then you can go through this, you know, finding out what your needs are, finding out what your resources are, and building those micro economies within Saltcross, right? Um, I'll pause there. I guess there's other thoughts, reflections, yeah. Um, I think what I'm taking from this, I'll jump straight to back to me, because this is something that I think I'll engage in as you keep explaining um, that project, is needing to deal with this in layers. So I think so far I've continued to see this at the very top level, the 5,000 people, the 2,200 homes, the business park, that kind of thing. And actually what I need to illustrate over the coming months is the different layers that this sits that are nested within this, such that you've got an individual household layer that sits within their little um, neighborhood piece or their little set of households uh, within a neighborhood, within their wider area of that part, up inside the, and so it would help me to sit and start to navigate those because each of those layers from the household layer upwards represents the same kind of dynamics that you're talking about because they are correctly arranged. So, and then they, there's permeability between them as well um, that will be good to illustrate. 
Well, so and it that's... represents the governance, you know. So, for example, if you've got four layers of governance you're involved in, if you're really involved in one, you're less involved in other. And that's probably answers all of our governance questions because a young family who's working, well, they've got their work governance and their politics at work. They got their family life and their governance of their children and all that stuff. So all their time's consumed. They have no time for local governance. Whereas, you know, the old retired people that no longer have that family governance dynamic, maybe they don't even have business governance anymore. Like now they have time for local governance. So, you know, nesting those governance circles and mapping them, you know, I think is going to be like the first step to, okay, who can participate where, how can they participate? You know, where are we expecting them to participate? Because putting one person in 17 circles of governance, which happens today, you know, mm -hmm. Participate on the federal level, the state level, also your local level, also in your business. It's, it's impossible. So we have to say, okay, how many spheres could one person really handle? And starting from that lens, we could see, oh, no, our governance model, we want people to be participating in 17 different places or whatever. Like, we know that's not going to work. But if we can narrow it down to say, nope, you're going to thrive and all your needs are going to be met in two or three governance contexts, that makes a lot more sense. Or what I showed you is four governance contexts, right? Mm. Um so I think that's one way of framing it from that governance perspective. How can we really address that? Well, what are we expecting of people? And how does that actually relate to them meeting their needs? This is a very human thing. If it's not going to impact your, your ability to meet your needs, you don't care. So young people today, a lot of people, including myself, think governance at a national level and probably even local is just kind of broken. And just, you know, depending on where you're at, it's just all sorts of problems. And you don't see the benefit of it. How is this going to help me meet my needs any better if I go and take all that time to vote? Like, yeah, you know, so if it is connected to your needs, then we don't have to worry about the, you know, the question of how do we get people involved? People are already involved in trying to meet their needs. You don't have to try to incentivize them to do that. They're going to do it automatically if it actually is going to impact their ability to meet their needs, right? So I think that also helps us make sure we're designing governance containers that matter, Um rather than you know arbitrary ones that people don't feel like are very beneficial for them today um so that might be helpful <laughs> it is helpful and i can see the appropriateness of it and that's um yeah it's pushed me into a line of thinking that i wasn't before i don't want to miss the opportunity just to talk through my rudimentary tokenomics understanding while sure. i've got you and yep. I, there's i don't need to pack it all in into this there's other times that i can bring this in within the wider group but um, I'll probably just run through it in a There's a list at this point of um, understood, uh, so like the brief that we're trying to create for ourselves as a, as a small group of planners, uh, then followed up with some efforts at trying to map that to different tokens. So we're talking still at the very top level, the token scale and trying to interact with the development model. Um, I'll just say like within the development model, like, we have an appraisal of all the costs and we've also got an ongoing appraisal of what it costs to maintain the village going forwards in another report. And I've got meetings next week to try and blend the two in our understanding. So we've got a full development appraisal of the costs and where currently landowners be getting something like 150 million out of this. And that's the sticking point because the current appraisal comes in at 19 million under. So like there's things to still work out at the, the like level the how you manage to tally this up so that someone starts building this thing um if they should build this i'm a i'm a sort of practical person in that it's not this is there's too many interests at play now that someone's going to let this go ahead unless the state intervenes so this is happening so how do we make this better is my current approach so i've got this and We've started, and I can share this with you to maybe get some other thoughts, but we've started to share what we want from this token system. Um, things like improved access to the affordable homes, which is a big part of this, like how currently accessibility to housing finance to get into affordable homes is very difficult. How can that be benefit? How can there be benefits, financial benefits that are afforded to people over a longer period to allow them to have affordable rents and home purchase? Um, incorporating active voices within this um, that we can in some way plan the resale formulas that are very familiar within a land trust mechanism um, such that when someone sells the home you can get an uplift in the home value but 
but not to market levels, which starts to get things. And it doesn't have to be to local wages, but it could be an index of, of various things that are appropriate to that place. And so planning that stuff in through this token model as well. Um, and then thinking about community wealth building at large. And so at the moment, we're talking about the um, class five principles. So we've got those sat down here as well. Plural ownership, financial power work for local places. These are like models for local spending to, to stop the leaky bucket issue of it being a value being sucked out of a place, like trying to keep spending within the place in which you're residing and working. That's what community wealth building essentially means within the UK context. Um, and there's some cities that are taking these five principles as approaches. Um, the, as I've said, like value, value accrual tokenomics, because from watching your videos, it feels like there's, there's so many options uh, that we could choose in the way that you've illustrated the different choices through that flow diagram. And I sat back thinking like, can there possibly be that many options when we're designing a neighborhood of which there's ones all over the world? I can see how you can shift it at the very local level, the like smaller scale level and have some variabilities based on like what you were saying around themes or what this place is about. And, but when it comes to like a city or town or village level, is, is it that op um, opaque is what I'm trying to say. You know, and I think, the variability of the token supply is an important one because you may have your what we can see in this business model of a fixed like supply of costs and values. The value is fixed at the starting point, and then all of these homes will increase in value based on the UK housing market or decrease, or however you want to look at it. But this is a fixed approach to the valuing of this scheme, and then it's edited over a, usually a 50-year a period, sometimes 65-year period based on a, an index, it's generally like one and a half to three um, percent. And, and so the shareholdings are fixed, but what I can see about the variability is as you want to expand the scheme, as you want to build new stuff, as you want to invest in businesses, like as you want to grow the value, attract new value into that through national grant funding or extra loans. Or, and so the token supply will be variable. And sort of, take from you on are we even thinking about fixed token supplies at all when we're talking about these kinds of schemes i'm not i think it would be uh i think if you have a fixed token supply you're going to either concentrate wealth or you have to add new things in to not do that so i'm opposed to fixed right. token supply personally just because i find it a, a limiting factor and it's digital scarcity and it's all the you know old motivators. However, as you see with Bitcoin, it got really popular because it had a fixed future supply. And that's the main narrative that drives it. So a lot of people, you know, have that meme and think it's important um, that it's a fixed supply. So I think the only value there is from its meme potential and the value people think is it being important. Um, and the fear that if it's a variable supply, oh, well, am I going to get liquidated down to nothing? So Two ways that I like this is one, Bitcoin's not actually fixed. It's making you know fifteen billion dollars worth of Bitcoin each year. Last year it did, and ten billion of that was sold to pay electricity costs. You know, so it's not fixed as a future max supply, which is a misnomer for a lot of people. So I think maybe it makes sense for projects if they feel the need, if they want to address that fear of what happens if we get liquidated down to nothing or whatever. You can set a max supply. That's you know the future high cap of however many you will mint in the future. So maybe if the project starts off with 500 million tokens, you think, all right, under reasonable expectations over the next 50 years, we can't imagine us going more than you know 15 billion or whatever it is. And then you set a max supply and say, we'll never go more than this. So that is comfortable for some people who are like, ooh, am I going to get liquidated to such that the investment I have right now could be one hundredth of what it's worth? Be like, oh no, worst case scenario, it'll be one whatever. Right. Um, so you can set a max supply variable to me, I think, is just the way to go. Um, it gives you more flexibility. Um, it's not concentrating wealth by default. Um, so I'd say that the combination that seems to be a winner is a variable supply with a max cap. That is something that is definitely going to be obtainable, but that gives confidence to people that, you know, it can't go above that. And those are two parameters that all tokens come with that we're building is they allow you to set a max. Um, which you can do. 
Um, emission schedule, I think I love real time and because we can. The only reason I wouldn't say real time is if just laws require you to do something otherwise. So if the law says you have to issue these tokens you, or shares rather, if they're the tokens representing a share, um, then maybe you do that once every six months or whatever. And then you use a separate token that you're issuing real time. Um, so the emission schedule, I would just say, is based off of, and that's if you're using the standard contribution accounting token that's attached to land. Um, emission schedule, if you've got vested tokens, which will be different, and, but there's some standard you know, vesting schedules out there that you can mimic if you want. Um, so this might be the larger investors who you're going to you know, send tokens to over time. But I would say that that's the vesting schedule rather than the emission schedule. So the creation of new tokens is what's called emissions. Um, versus unlocking tokens you've already earned, which would be vesting. Um, was that helpful? That's helpful. That's helpful. Yeah, it feels like I've got a definite, like a more definitive answer at those top levels. I've taken some notes elsewhere, um, and so the three bits that I'll we can close this as you need because I know we've been going for over an hour, but like the. I've called these things salty voice and salty bond and salty pound at this point mm. as a just like trying to get my head around it. And so I, I mentioned the the bond system uh, the other day that's based on the other scheme that I've studied quite carefully. Um, I can actually show you that briefly. So like this real this scheme here, which is developing out the climate innovation district in Leeds. Uh, they do have these three and a half thousand pound bonds. So that's the, as I mentioned the other day, oh, and they are not attached. Not showing me. You got to change your screen share. Thanks. No, no worries. Um, so um, this real scheme in Leeds Climate Innovation District, passive house scheme, factory on on site, uh, built over a number of years. The development model because the wider developers model owns a site level developer model. All developers use this so that they can trash this one if it goes wrong uh, and not affect the top level. So like they, that's the thing that takes on the assets. This is the site company. This is the liability restricted to this individual site. And then all assets will be transferred on completion to this entity, which the owners are the homeowners. Each has a 250 year lease to this entity and they all pay a three and a half thousand pound bond, which makes the initial treasury. Mm. Um, and this allows them to do stuff in their area. So everything else is already set up, like the restaurants are running, the infrastructure is already there, like they're coming into a new, a fully built out new scheme that's fully paid for at that point. But they also have a three and a half thousand pound bond per household treasury to be using to maintain the resilience of their place. So that's where I was approaching this when I was saying to you this idea of having this treasury created for the ongoing management and maintenance uh, through this thing called salty bond at this point, but sold with the home exchange and the relationships between this and the governance token is something that I don't quite understand yet. Like I'm being quite honest with this stuff. It's like, this is, this is quite tough for me and it might take a quite a while longer to get these bits of it, but I'm just trying to mimic at this stage. So yeah. Um, so another uh, another map I'd plug in here is using the NFT, which is sold with a home exchange, great as de facto title for your home. So that NFT is attached to your actual home, and that's how you sell your home too. So if you sell your NFT to someone on the market, then you also will send them your title, and along with that, you'll get out of your house and give it to them, etc. <laughs> um, but then the NFT that you're holding in your wallet is just saying this gives me access to this house as long as I'm holding it, right? Um, so that's why I see other projects extending that NFT as just de facto title of your house. Um, and it's also what we're doing here, just more brain food for you. Um, for existing homeowners that are adjacent to our project, we're going to airdrop them an NFT representing their title. And then should they sell that to someone, we'll also sell their house. So they could look at like the, the market price for those NFTs for that region. And that might entice them to sell because this is also us, you know, 
there's some awesome people around, but what would it be like if they weren't really part of the, what we're trying to do here? You know, if they see online, oh, I can sell my house for above market value because people are really bought into the vision happening here, you know, that could also help extend our project to neighboring places um, and using that NFT airdrop. Anyway, so I would say the NFT is, could be also just de facto um, title for the project. And that's another way of using NFTs to say who's, you know, getting access to this project, who's part of the household, et cetera. Um, governance, that token, just like that, perfect. Salty Pound, that token, just like that, also perfect. Um, and, yeah, and this not change this... much there. So I would, I'm wondering what's your, what, what do you feel like is missing? Because I don't see anything missing here except for that equity token that you were talking about before. Um, but if, all your equity i'll pause there to get what you have your question before i go down another rabbit hole i think this is and, th and to get the ant like what you're saying there is ideas against what i've currently got given that my experience so far on projects is a single token project that tries to do everything both governance and finance all together it my interactions with the course material in this cohort this is the first time i've come across this sort of multi-token approach and trying to track hyper so this is me trying to learn and so just hearing you say like sounds okay for now that sounds good um i've got well, to get what i see here missing in the tokens was how we started today's discussion with what does it look like to be issuing equity all the time because none of these tokens are equity tokens, unless you're wrapping that into the governance token. Uh, why I would say not do that, because then we're just making plutocratic governance. You know, If you could buy governance, meaning governance is for sale, then what did we just do? We said those with the most voice get the most governance. Now, of course, there's like quadratic voting and stuff like that. This is we're going to reduce that. Um, so that it's really up to each project and this is untested. Haifa said, let's separate that because we don't want to have, you know, plutocracy as default here. Even if there are schemes to reduce the effects of plutocracy, it's still governance by the wealthy. So what is that? You know, is that what we really want? Um, but some advocates you know, on the other side would say, well, you know, if people aren't having skin in the game, then you get bad governance outcomes. So, you know, plutocratic governance, yeah, it sounds bad, but, you know, that's what we actually want because we want people who are more invested to make, you know, more impact on the choices and decision making. Um, so they say, never mind, it's it's fine to have them packed into the same token. Um, and that's essentially what shares are today, right? Shares are both governance and value tokens. So yeah. we, we were just wanting to decouple that because it just increased the variability of the landscape. So projects could say, well, Maybe we just want to mimic it. And that's what Haifa really did for a while. It, I can get into how it separated. But for a long time, it was, you know, if you didn't get paid for $10 of work, you got 10 voice tokens and 10 Haifa tokens. So we're kind of mimicking. The difference was is that we set in, um, I forgot what we call this, waning essentially on voice tokens. So voice tokens then have a two-year half-life. So... When you earn voice from stuff you did years ago, it's going to have less impact. So that also moved governance to the people who are most active within the last period. So this naturally actually passed it on to the next generations. So in today's world, you know, when we don't do that, what we have is often the older people own everything and are making all the decisions all the time. And then it gets more conservative and et cetera. And we get all these problems. So this is a way of like building in that passing of the torch, so to speak, because we can bake in a half-life on the governance tokens. But you don't want a half-life on your equity tokens. Otherwise, people are just going to want to sell them all the time. You know, <laughs> So you can't do that if the tokens are both governance and equity, if you know what I mean. So separating those allowed us to do interesting things like that. So that's why I'm a big advocate of separating them. You can have them be the same thing you know, to start with, if that's the simplicity you're looking for. But then it just gives you the ability you know, to make them something different and to start tweaking things with different, you know, between the two. Um, so, however, from the last bit on this, because it's just everything at once, one of the reasons why the crypto space did governance tokens was it got around the SEC bit. They said, yeah, this is just for making governance decisions. But if governance got to, you know, controls a the treasury, then there's a lot of value behind those governance tokens. So then they are starting to act like de facto equity tokens, which is really what they wanted to sell. 
but they couldn't sell that legally, so they sold governance tokens instead. <laughs> so I think that's why a lot of the crypto space went with that because it got around a lot of the you know existing laws with selling equity and instead sold governance, which acts as valuable as equity. So anyway, it was it was kind of a workaround for why I saw it getting popular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. I think let me get back to you on that one then because yeah, I think it might be a place for a further conversation maybe with some other people in it as well, like brought to the main stage because I'm going to need to think about some of these things. I think what I saw was that this... Um, having this bond sat at the center represented equity in some way in the, in the association. Um, and I just need to get my, I just need to allow my cogs to turn a little bit on some of those things. Um, One more piece come back to you. before. Yeah. I'm okay. going to definitely sit on this. We, well, we all need to sit on this. <laughs> um, it, it just goes back to the start. Then if you're issuing equity for contributions, you wouldn't be able to do that with the existing setup. So if that is something you want to do with your project, because you can't issue a share of an NFT. So for example, some projects say, hey, you know, if you do this quest of going out there and planting a tree or whatever it is, you can earn 10 shares of equity in the organization represented as 10 tokens. Um, with this current setup, you couldn't do that. You can give them more governance voice, right? Um, but you can't give them, you know, a share of a house of an NFT. Why the NFT, each one's worth, you know, 500K if that's the base floor for housing there or whatever it is. Um, you're not able to issue an ongoing equity, if that makes sense. So yes, the de facto, the NFT is going to seem that way because it's going to fluctuate in value based on the whole value of the project. So it's going to be, a, you know, an equity indicator the same way as equity would be. Yeah. Um, so it serves that need. It just wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to continue you know, minting equity real time, which maybe you don't want to do because that was seeming to be a, a holdup. So I'm not saying, anyway. I don't think it's a holdup. No, I think it's um, <clears throat> possible. I think the, the gap here is at the moment, I'm thinking you get an NFT sold with the home, which then you get airdropped in one chunk, your governance rights, which I was thinking, which I think is actually your equity instead. I think it's the other way around maybe. So I've just got, that's the bit I can think about. I'm trying to incentivize people through this 10-year period to stay in their homes, to continue to contribute to that community. And if you leave after year one, you don't walk away with as much as you would if you stayed for 10 years plus, like this, that levels of commitment to a place through the valuation of the token system. So that's all I'm getting through this, whether it's this governance thing could be pulled out and replaced with something else. Um, I have a way we can play with this then. And it's, you get your NFT, and then every year you're at the project, you get another badge saying you've been there another year. And when you have this badge, it gives you a 10% or whatever you want it to be, bonus on any voice or equity you earn. So you can have a similar scheme that way, that the longer you're there, the more you can earn and Probably, and what we're also inferring here is the more valuable your contribution, because people who have been there for 10 years are going to have more knowledge and wisdom of what the community might need and more ability to affect change because of the relationships they have, et cetera. So it's also a way of you know acknowledging the added value that their contributions are likely bringing um, based off the time that they're there. So I think you can have a similar yeah. like that to issue out those badges. But of course, you can have badges for all sorts of different things, you know. Um, and then when they're earning equity and governance tokens for going out there and planting a tree or having a role at the community village or whatever it is that they're doing and contributing, then how long they've been there is going to act as a bonus then um, when they're earning those tokens. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, yeah. I've, I think there'll be some issues with that as well to unpack, but... Um... In terms of who has a voice potentially and who starts to concentrate the equity but um i think i'd like to stop here and just like take <laughs> what you've offered me already yeah. and um and come back to you with some other things this is exactly what i wanted for initial chat is just to like play out some of my current issues i can share this with you as melter like it's only short but like, just to have a quick read through um and to just sort of as a pointer to set me off in a different direction. So what I've got from this call is this layering conversation, like point of 
trying to design this at multiple different layers and understand the relationships. And then through this is a sort of, I've got a better understanding, I think, of um, the top level stuff and then the potential missing piece of an equity part here that needs to be solved. Now I'll leave you with one more thing and it's to plug the layers potentially in with the governance and equity tokens. So with every DAO, a successive nested DAO that they're part of would have its own governance tokens and its own equity tokens, right? Meaning every neighborhood could have its own equity, right? And the whole SART cost project could as well. So when you're talking about earning governance, you could be earning it in multiple contexts and maybe even simultaneously, like when you're contributing to a neighborhood, does that also earn you governance in all of Salt Cross? Or only when you're working on the meta story of Salt Cross as a whole, are you earning Salt Cross tokens, right? So each one of those spheres that I talked about is also its own governance context within your project. Mm -hmm. All right, so you don't have one governance token across Salt Cross. Right, because if each neighborhood has its own DAO, each neighborhood would also have its own governance token. Right. Yeah. If you want it to be, then that's well, that would make the most sense, and that's how Haifa's setting it up is that each circle, because that's how this would rep be represented. Salt Cross as a whole would be one DAO, but then you'd have sub DAOs, which we call circles or call them whatever, um, that represent the neighborhoods that have their own governance contexts for that neighborhood. All right. Is this how other projects within Region Civics are currently moving? Um, I don't. The, the other projects that have neighborhoods, yes. Uh, a lot of projects are one kind of neighborhood. Um, but I probably will see that changing because this is a new meme coming out of how to, you know, build neighborhoods and fractal it down uh, within governance context. But. Okay. It just connects with what you shared with me at the beginning with having separate project DAOs. Um, each it, it DAO connects to the levels as well context. for me. Yeah. In telling the story, like understanding these levels, could there could be something there. I think for now, I keep it simple and like layer in some of this detail. Um, I'm going to have to to go, right. but I really appreciated um, the time you've given me here. Of um, and I feel a bit reoriented actually in um, some of the elements that I wasn't certain about. Um, or is just starting to explore. So thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, this was a good brain teaser for me, so I appreciated it. <laughs> you know? Yes, brain <laughs> explosion for me. Yeah. Um, but um, that's, this has been great. So yeah, I'll get back to you on some of the things, some of the prompts you've given me um, and try and explain them out a bit. And um, otherwise, yeah, we'll catch up next Tuesday for the next session. But um, I want to try and connect more with some of the other projects to, to understand their trajectories on this stuff. Because like I said, being inside the TDF campus helped me so much in trying to develop my own project. I've taken so much from it and given lots as well. And uh, I've understood a lot of the dynamics of that project. Um, so being able to compare my, uh, the differences and similarities is very useful in trying to chart this. Yeah. Awesome. Well, incredible, brother. Go out there, explore, and any, any inspiration you get, feel free to feed it back. <laughs> Absolutely will do. See you next Tuesday, brother. Talk Thanks, soon. Thanks, Bye. Cheers.